was asked uh, just briefly on the on the Skype line here how many there is of us. So somebody do a quick count. So. We're just still settling in a little bit there. About thirty-two. Thirty-three. Oh, 30, and thirty-three is coming. Okay. Well, we'll probably start uh, without thirty-three just yet. <laughs> well, you astounded me. There's far more than I had anticipated, so uh, I'm very grateful for you to be here all this afternoon. Uh, I was saying I'm not going to be in service this Sunday because I have other commitments in the Selkirk Presbytery, but I could do it right now, and most of you are here. So. <laughs> A lot of you. So friends and colleagues, I give thanks for you all to be here. Uh, and thanks to all those, uh, I see Murray's just walking away, but for his assistance in helping me get set up, and, and uh, Mary in the office, and my wife who's facilitated so many things, including keeping me a little sane this week. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Reverend Susan Wilhock, who's on the line with us today, who uh, also has been a huge benefit to all my classes we've gone through uh, preparing for our presentations today. I'm not sure how many we have online. Uh, we might have our crowd from, uh, more people from Oak Lake who are actually sitting at the Legion where, uh, where they've Skyped into it and they have a shine on the overhead. So we probably have some more there as well. So I'm uh, humbled by all of your uh, presence today. So thank you for, uh, for that. Uh, as I mentioned, we have Dr. Reverend Susan Wilhock, my professor for our grad project, who has Skyped in, she's facilitating that, she's on the line. So, um, Dr. Wilhock, did you have something you wanted to say before we start? Um, uh, John, uh, no, thank you so much for those, um, for those kind words. And I look, really look forward to this exciting research that you've been involved with. And um, thank you for uh, the opportunity to be present. And we've got some, some participants here online. I apologize for my voice. I'm losing my voice to, uh, today. But um, anyway, so uh, thank you all for being there and for your support of Don and uh, for your support of AST. Thank you. I'd like to begin today with starting with a piece of scripture from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. It reads, Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days, and visions were not wise, widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you have called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up, and again went to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Now Samuel, sorry, the Lord called Samuel again a third time. He got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said, Go to Samuel. So therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the inequity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. 
Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me that he has said to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. So ends that scripture reading. I'm just going to turn this mic down because of a little bit of feedback, and I think I know what I'm doing if I do that. to see if that gives a little less of the, the feedback. <coughs> so before I talk about the specific research question, I just want to share with you a little bit about how I arrived at the topic that I'm going to be speaking about today. Back in the summer of 2013, I arrived in Halifax for my very first summer there at AST. And I don't really know what to expect, but whatever it was I was expecting wasn't what I found. I kind of thought I'm a little bit older, I might be a little bit more of the senior crowd coming in, but as it turned out, I fit in very well. There were some a little older, some a little younger, um, a few quite a bit younger. But I wasn't as old as I thought I might be. <laughs> so as I was thinking about what question I would ask for my research project, I reflected on my coming into ministry, or accepting a call into ministry at an older age, and uh, at least what I thought was an older age. I was about 45 at the time. And as I thought about that, I thought, what would be the impetus for somebody of my age to leave a lucrative career to go into a, a vocation of ministry? So I thought about that, and I started looking at what the United Church has to say about it with our uh, report on demographics. And I found out that my age group is not underrepresented in any way. As you can see by this chart on the right hand side, that's where I sit, is on this side, not on that side. I know you're surprised, but it's just true. So it had me wondering, before I was ever even 30 years old, I remember the exact moment when I, when I thought ministry is maybe what I should be doing. I felt a real call to it. But I did what we do, like a spurt of ambition. I laid down until it went away. And I never, never did go into ministry. So I was talking to a colleague of mine about my grad project and saying about us older people going in. And I reflected about being at a younger age when I was first called. And it was his suggestion that said, what would have made the difference when you were 28 years old, when you felt that call come? What would have made you actually say yes instead of no at that time? So that's what led me eventually to my grad project question. What influences adults under 30 years old to enter ordained ministry as a vocation within the United Church of Canada? <coughs> that was deliberate so you could read it again. <coughs> Just so you can hang on the question. What influences adults under 30 years old to enter ordained ministry as a vocation within the United Church of Canada? Well, once you have your question, you really have to ask, does it matter? Does anybody really care? <coughs> when, the, when the question is, or to begin to answer that question, I went and I started reviewing some of those demographics. The report on demographics to, uh, presented by the, uh, or presented to the executive at, of general counsel at the United Church, uh, did an in-depth study on where we are as a church, age, gender, um, and, and various things like that. And so one of the very first ones that they recognized was that as a demographic, we were missing the 35 and under group of ministers. As I continue looking at the recommendations, the fourth recommendation and the fifth recommendation were on an emphasis to youth and a youth-friendly candidacy process. The sixth recommendation highlights the pressure our current demographics will have on the pension plan when the average time in the plan before retirement continues to drop. So clearly from that demographic uh, report, there was a real need for ministry to be coming in at a younger age instead of serving at the age 
like I am now. So I concluded that it matters. So I'd like to read this short piece of scripture from Jeremiah. Then I said, Ah, oh Lord, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy. You shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Jeremiah chapter 1. Astley and Francis, in their journal publication, Young Vocation to Ordained Ministry, a qualitative study, described the need to accept into our theology a biblical understanding that our young people can be an equal part in positions of ministry. There's lots of precedent in the scripture, Samuel, Jeremiah, Jesus himself, of course, just to name a few. I was part of a congregation quite a number of years ago now, and it was the joint needs and joint search committee terminology at the time. So the joint search committee had found a new candidate, a new, uh, newly ordained candidate that they were presenting to be our new minister. So we had our congregational meeting and they were really excited about putting this candidate forward. And someone asked the question, but you know, he's kind of young. Will he be able to relate to us? And the response was that Jesus was pretty young and he did a pretty good job. Theology built on scriptures like Jeremiah and others tells us that God can use all of us who are called, and God puts words into our mouth. This project is propelled by my assumption that we actually want young adults to choose a vocation of ministry in the United Church of Canada. That we want young people and families in our congregations, and we want ministers who can relate to them. Joanna Gilbert in her journal publication, A Future Full of Hope, cautions those of us that have long surpassed that age of 30. It can be challenging to listen to the ideas and the hopes and the fears of this younger generation. But she also says it can be encouraging as long as we are courageous, generous in spirit, and open to the challenges that we hear from them. So the goals are pretty straightforward from this project. Although I don't anticipate this particular project solving any of the problems of an underrepresented demographic of young adults entering ministry. I hope to provide some information from the experiences and ideas of the participants that will be valuable to understand what experiences the United Church can provide in order to identify and to nurture a call into ordained ministry. As well, I'd like to explore how these themes might filter into the life of the church. So we need to talk a little bit about the methodology used. It is a qualitative research project, and in this project I employed uh, phenomenology. I found it appropriate for the study of the participants' conscious experiences of their everyday life and their social action. Phenomenology is used to provide core meanings mutually understood by each participant. It's the experiences that these people share that is of particular interest, leading to a better understanding of why young people choose ministry as a vocation at an early age what they experienced and how they experienced it. It's well suited to studying these effective and emotional human experiences. This included common experiences leading to discernment, theological college, and a vocation of ministry. My role is to describe and interpret those experiences. So for this particular project, I interviewed six uh, volunteers. They're all, they were all under the age of 30 as they entered into a recognized United Church Theological College. And each had not graduated from that college any more than five years earlier. The reason for that was I wanted to make sure their memories and their experiences were still as fresh as possible. So this methodology will enable the participants to tell their stories through an open narrative questions and less of the short answer type questions. From the responses, the task is to find areas of commonality amongst them, represented by the little dot in the center. So from all these threads and all this information, I was able to come up with these themes, these six themes that brought themselves forward. So commonality uh, amongst all the participants. Support, affirmation, denominal, denominational influences, young group and our youth group in Christian education, university undergrad experience, and their call experiences. So we begin with support. 
Support. The first and probably the most obvious one is support. Support was significantly reflected by each participant and that it was important to them. Support by parents was universal among all the participants. Most spoke specifically of their parents and were concerned with how they would respond when they were informed of their call to a vocation of ministry. Two of them were not concerned at all because of a family heritage of ministers within their family, and they were confident in their acceptance, and they confirmed that for me. This is not to say that all family members outside of the parents are supportive. There's one particular case that I would describe as hostile to the idea of ministry, but in this particular study, that was an exception. It's also significant to note that no one suggested that they would not go into ministry if they didn't have that support. However, one of the things that I just want to break out of this support was the father. Their father, not the father, just to be clear. <laughs> Although I'm sure the father had some influence as well. Support was significant, the, the support by the parents was always significant for all of them. But I broke this one out because without any specific asking about parents or the individuals, three of the members brought up their father and spoke about the support or acceptance of, of him. Two mentioned being apprehensive about telling their father. I could go on, but it was basically the father seemed to be singled out more than the mother in this conversation. Now, by the study, I am in no way saying that the mother's uh, sentiment or impression would have been any less significant than what the father's opinion was. There's nothing in the study that would say that. But it was just curious to see that they made a point of bringing up the father. I do have some speculative reasons why that might be myself, but uh, I would be stepping out on a limb on the study for that. The next theme is affirmation. So just to clarify, support are those people that once told of your decision in, in life, in this case candidacy for, for ministry, is to get behind them, give them that, that, that sense that you will be there for them. Affirmation is that where you confirm their call, is where someone will actually come to them and say, yes, I see that in you, or perhaps even before they've recognized the call themselves. It might be floating in their mind, but they needed someone to come along and say, I think you would be good in ministry. There were only two calls that were confirmed by a clergy member. When the pastor of one told them they would be good at ministry, and they should consider it, the participant responded after uh, or in regard to their investment of already two years of university. Why didn't you tell me this two years ago? I just wasted how much money on this thing? One student was by another, or one was by another student while they were in university. Those who were affirmed by clergy had previously experienced what they would describe as a Holy Spirit moment, and the decision to accept ministry as their vocation was confirmed by the clergy. So affirmation wasn't as universally sought by church leadership as I had suspected. Now it gets a little bit uh, intertwined in two different topics. I'm going to begin about the influences of other denominations on these candidates. Our denomination is not unique when we say, where are the youth? Where are the kids? Where are they coming from? Where have they gone? This is where youth groups and denominations collide, and it's a bit difficult to explain all the inner workings of these, but I'm going to try. The participants in this study, with one exception, were influenced by other denominations in some way. Some were left with the decision to make between denominations to commit to. Five of the six were involved with other Christian denominations. Of these five, four attended youth groups at other denominations, and at that time not with any United Church, so not simultaneously, solely with another denomination. And of those four who spent their time at, an, at the youth groups of, of another denomination, two left their United Churches solely for the reason to attend a youth group at another denomination. Two others were influenced by an evangelical denomination during their college years. The Alliance Church, Evangelical Congregations, and the Anglican Church played prominently as did the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church to a little lesser degree. I'm going to return to the denominations in a, in a few minutes, but now I want to talk about our Christian education and youth group. This is where the rubber really hits the road in universality. Nothing 
was more universal to the participants than their involvement in Christian education and youth peer groups. From Sunday school to youth groups to faith communities in high school and in college. Five spoke specifically about being raised in the church, with two mentioning that their congregations were, extension, were an extension of their own family. All six provided leadership at one time or another in youth groups, often including the development of the programming itself. No one single factor was as common as youth involvement in their church families. A quote from one of the participants, I think as a child having that foundation allowed me to leave the church in a way, and come back to it. I think those early years were really important in, in somehow ending up in ministry now. That's a whole research project in itself. And this is where the theme of youth groups overlap with the discussion of denominations. As I mentioned earlier, it's a little bit of a spider web when trying to trace the interconnections between our youth activities and the influence of other denominations. Two of the participants of the six connected to another denomination, in this case the Anglican and, and Evangelical denomination, specifically so they could participate in youth programming. Five of them became active in youth programming in other denominations at some point before their call to a vocation of ministry. One participant spoke of their United Church investing in, a youth, in youth programming even though they had no youth. They were making an investment as they recognized its importance. However, after a relocation, this person had to leave the United Church in order to be involved in a youth program, then returned to the United Church by request to help them develop a, and lead a youth program. Three had involvement in other denominations while in university, before choosing the United Church as their home for discernment. What I'm understanding is that these participants, when there was a lack of youth programming in the United Church, went elsewhere. Two of the participants identified these denominations as contributing to their faith understanding today, allowing that influence to be part of their ministry today. Another theme that I hadn't even considered uh, until going through the data, was the university undergrad experience. One of the more surprising experiences amongst the participants was the timing of their call. Five of the participants, to varying degrees, was already taking their university undergrad when they accepted their call. One returned to university after accepting and understanding they had a call into ministry. Four of those participants were actively working on another degree another vocation in life. When their call came, all four of them switched their, their degree program at that time to move into other programs more in line with uh, a, a, a role moving into uh, a Master of Divinity stu study somewhere <coughs> within a United Church approved college. Many of them had transferred all the credits they had accumulated into this other uh, program. Everything from Bachelor of Commerce to Anthropology degrees to um, Forensic degrees, it was uh, quite a varied group. But it's interesting to note how they, at the timing of that call and the commitment they made in changing their vocation. One participant had been, had been in university for many years and just was completing their undergrad degree when they were called into ministry. For this person, it was a sudden awareness of a call that they felt had been there all along but it needed someone to point at them and say, you should be a minister. Within a couple of weeks after that conversation and completing that degree, that person began their studies at uh, Atlantic School of Theology. No one initially entered university with the intention of accepting a call into ministry as their vocation. And I thought, that's telling us something. No one entered university with a call to ministry already in mind. So I want to talk a little bit about the call experience. <coughs> Each participant had a personal call experience. It's that call from God that's undeniable. It's that call from God that's unmistakable. When this individual unique call experience occurred, each described their decision to go into, into ministry as beyond their control. They had no choice. 
Four of them specifically said, I would do something else if I could, but I can't. The idea of going to school for eight years to join a mainline denomination at this particular time did not make any sense. But like Martin Luther in his moment, they could do no other. Not so much what I would call a theme, but I think an important uh, conversation that uh, occurred. It's attitude. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the perceived attitude of the United Church from some of the, uh, some of the participants. I'll begin with a scripture from Matthew. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and said, Truly I tell you, Unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. A reading from Matthew chapter 18. There were few matters in regard to discernment. There were a few matters that, are, that uh, came up regarding discernment that I think are noteworthy. The participants are not children, of course, but Jesus welcomed the young and told the old to be like the young. I should mention, initially, I hadn't brought up um, or, in, or instigated a question around discernment. Uh, it just was passionate for a couple who brought it up in the conversation. So that's where these really came from. Theology, built upon scriptures like Jeremiah and others, tell us that God can use all of us who are called, and God will put the words in our mouths. God called these young adults who felt they didn't have another option. But there are others who do have options. Parker Palmer, in his book, Let Your Life Speak, relates to this when he talks about seeking a path more powerful than accumulating wealth and power, and learn to understand the need to let higher truths and values guide him. Of those that dis discussed discernment, some were very positive, some were not. Two participants were openly discouraged during their discernment process, incur being encouraged or encouraging them to go out and learn something about life first. Those involved in the process were not always sensitive to the magnitude of the decision that this candidate was actually under. This report on demographics recommended recommendation five is to create a youth-friendly candidacy process. I want to remind us again of Joan Gilbert's words that I mentioned earlier. Those of us that have long surpassed that age of 30, it can be challenging to listen to the ideas, hopes, and fears of this younger generation. But she also says it can be encouraging as long as we are courageous, generous in spirit, and open to the challenges of what it is we might hear. So after this, I decided that it does matter. The report on demographics discusses profiles of interest in understanding the strengths and weaknesses of our current ministry profile. They inform us that the age profile is an important indicator of the church's sustainability in terms of ministry personnel to serve the current context and generation. In other words, we need leadership that can relate to each generation we desire to have in our churches and understand the context of their lives. I assume we all agree that we want all generations represented in our congregations helping us to be the church. Hope to provide information that will be valuable in understanding what experiences the United Church can provide youth to nurture a call into ordained ministry. It's important to understand how younger people today come to the vocation of ministry. So from that, I come with a few implications and recommendations. It's difficult to be a welcoming church when we don't understand the context of each generation we desire to have in our congregations. We need leadership in every generation. We must highlight the influence of Sunday school and youth involvement. Each participant highlighted their involvement and commitment to a Christian-based youth group experience. So I guess a recommendation would be the individual church is too small. We need to find ways to cluster with others to nurture the faith formation of our youth. Those self-motivated will go elsewhere. As we teach and influence youth through Sunday school and youth, and youth group experiences, they may well leave the church behind as they enter into adulthood. 
but it's the church experience that will maintain a road back when they're ready to take it. Without that experience, there is no road to return from. Without that foundation, there's no house to come back to. The next one, out of sight, is not out of mind. The experience of the participants in this study indicate that the call to ministry, to a vocation of ministry, doesn't necessarily happen in high school. The foundation of a Christian education is laid during that time, but the realization of God's calling on their lives, in the case of these participants, occurred during their mid or early to mid twenties. Next, I would tell you, talk to them. They're real people. Don't underestimate how our affirmation can awaken a calling that was already there, just needing that confirmation that someone else, someone meaningful to them, also sees it in them. Plant the seeds of faith and affirmation and see if they don't grow. I think there's a reading from Ecclesiastes that fits well into that. Plant your seeds, there's a time to do that, and there's later a time to sow. So I'll conclude today's conversation. I just want to say that this study is not, again, going to resolve any issues around the lack of young adults choosing a ministry as a vocation. But I do believe it highlights investments that we will have to make in order to nurture our youth. And without nurtured youth, where will the future of our clergy come from? This time I'd like to thank you for your time. I'm not sure how I did time-wise. I'd like to thank you for your time and participation this afternoon. Uh, this is a time when we enter into, did I get far behind? Nope, any questions and answers. Um, enter into a time of questions and answers. And I think a point of privilege, uh, the first uh, question, if there is any, uh, is offered to my professor, uh, Susan Wilhock, if she would <coughs> like to begin, or if she's ready to begin. Well, thank you so much, Don, for this important uh, research and for highlighting the importance of youth ministry, really, in, in um, creating a, a pipeline for young people to, uh, to grow into their faith and into their call to ministry. So I was thinking as you were presenting how um, we live in a uh, society that both uh, worships and idolizes youth on the one hand, and then at the same time, we dismiss youth. We have harmful stereotypes about them. And I wonder, um, you know, what, what you would say, is, you know, what should the UCC be doing differently in terms of making it easier for um, young people to hear that call and to progress um, into the, um, um, ordained ministry, uh, is there something that, uh, how, should we uh, should we make it easier for them to go into the ministry? Is there something we can do for theological education? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Thank you for that question, Susan. Um, in, in some ways, I have this feeling like, you know, how do we get the horses back in the barn uh, where so many of our youth are already gone? So one of our first challenges is reaching out to them now and asking them to come back and uh, spend some time with us. Unrelated to this research, I have done some reading about the spirituality, um, not so much the religiousness, but the spirituality of the younger generations, millennials and others, and how they've reacquainted to it. Frankly, it's my generation or, the, or, or really probably the farthest from having that. So that opportunity is really there. I, I think there's a couple things that have come up that I'd like to propose, and one is the investment in youth programming. Um, I think last time I checked, we're not allowed to kidnap them and bring them in, but we do need to give events that are fun to introduce them to a Christian environment, not so much pound them with theology and, and God talk initially, but bring them into that Christian family, that sense of what a Christian family is first, and then start, um, and then help them grow in that as we can grow with them. Because frankly, we've lost how to do this with you. So I don't think it's just us trying to tell them something. I think this is a partnership. We need to bring youth in, we need to walk alongside them, we need to listen to them, and we need to uh, create a pathway for them. So it's to bring them in, get them involved, 
it's easy to say they're not here, and we can go out and try to bring them in, but they have to want to come. So we think that's the beginning. It's creating uh, one-time events, things of that nature that can draw their interest. I don't think, you know, once, I'll base it on the, on the uh, participants from this study. These participants, there was, the idea if it was easier was not part of the conversation. I don't think easy is part of it. I think um, once anybody has decided that they want to choose a vocation of ministry, uh, easy isn't a word that, um, that we really use anymore. So I don't think it's about easy, but I do think we need to be flexible. We need to understand how people learn. Um, it's not necessarily sitting behind desks and lectures anymore. They've got other, uh, other media options. So I think we need to be more flexible in how we educate. But I wouldn't say it's about lowering the bar. It's perhaps just about doing it differently. And this is where, instead of a 55-year-old <laughs> uh, paid accountable clergy, but a 30-year-old here would probably give you a far better answer. And I think that's that uh, a highlight of that demographic, that if we had them talking about that current context, would certainly um, benefit us all. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. That's, that's helpful, thank you. Too much? <laughs> Do you have any other, Susan? I think Patrick has his hand raised. Okay, and sorry, the monitor's a little far for me to see that, so. Patrick? You need to put your glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, one question. Um, in your research, was there anything that indicated in the six, with the six research partners you had, that there was a history um, from early childhood um, in the church, like, did, did you did you notice if that had any bearing on whether or not um, that led to deeper involvement as a young as a, as a teen and young adult? And that like did, was that any was that any bearing on on these people going into ministry? Uh, thank you, Patrick. Patrick, by the way, is one of my fellow peers. He'll be doing his grad project in a, in a week or so. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I guess the answer is predominantly yes. Most were involved at a very young age. Some of them, their parents were directly involved. So in one case, the parent was the youth program leader. Uh, one person spent all their time in, uh, um, in church in different ways. But uh, I would say overall, all of them were involved in Sunday school at one point. I do want to point out one important thing, or one thing I think is important. One, it's just one um, participant, but I think I relate to, to, to this person. Um, they actually stopped attending Sunday school as a youth and found more value in the worship experience. So I think that's something else to highlight, is not just to assume this is what you need. If, they would, if a youth would prefer to sit up and get more value from being in community upstairs, <laughs> uh, we should do that. Um, but I, to answer your question more specifically, Patrick, I think, yes, most of them were involved throughout their, their childhood. One did talk about leaving, like the whole family stopped going to church, so this person did too. And then it was actually them who said to their family, I think we need to go back to church. <laughs> and it was the mother who rounded them up and said, okay, let's do it. And, uh, and then returned to church. So um, it was good. So there you go. When the, when the child says, we better get to church, you better get to church. <laughs> uh, did I answer your question, Patrick? Yes, thank you. Don, it's Phil. Can I uh, ask the next question? Certainly. Phil is the, the three of us four that are doing our uh, grad project this year. Uh, greetings from Kingston, Ontario. <laughs> Um, you said something early in your presentation about only two of your research partners um, had received affirmations from clergy, if I, if I recalled that yeah. correctly. Yes. Um, I just wonder what, what did you mean by, by that interpretation? Was it that they intentionally sought the affirmation of the clergy? Or was that a significant piece that, for the two that received it, for the other four that didn't, was that, was that uh, impactful on them? 
Very good question, Phil. Thank you. The, the, I don't, hope you can hear these questions. They're a little hard to repeat back. Um, the, but could you repeat it again? For me? No, just <laughs> The, I want to approach it this way. No one openly went and sought affirmation from a clergy member. Uh, in those cases, like the one I, I gave a quote where the, the person said, I spent money in two years in, in this degree. If you would have told me, I would have done something else. Why didn't you tell me sooner? Um, I don't think any of them sought it. I, I mean, and you're right, it did mention two uh, clergy who approached the people and, and said, I see this in you. I think you would be good at this. In all, well, in all cases, that affirmation came when the person already knew, just hadn't acknowledged it, either didn't say it outward or hadn't received it inwardly yet. But it was like the impetus that pushed them over the edge. However, I don't want to minimize the, the amount of uh, feedback that I was receiving from the participants around interaction with clergy and encouragement just in life with clergy. One talked about the senior pastor, who um, he talked about being a relatively quiet man, didn't speak to them much, and he's a big man. And they were in, I'll say junior high, I can't remember the, the age, but uh, this person came, found him and his friends, or I gave away the gender there, but found this person and their friend and, uh, and took them for Slurpees and spent an afternoon visiting with them, getting to know them, understanding how life was with them and how things were going. And even though that was in junior high and this person is, you know, I'll say about 30 now, um, that memory and that, that impact to them isn't, can't be measured. So although none of them sought um, clergy feedback, it's that kind of leadership that really plants those seeds for, for future, and clergy, I think, have a huge role of recognizing it. I, I will say, too, y y you can't over-fertilize. <laughs> but, uh, in other words, if you've got 12 youth in there and you go to every one of them and tell them they're all going to be ministers, hoping one will, it probably won't have the same effect. But, um, anyway, did I answer your question, Phil? Yeah, you did, and, and if I could just ask, uh, ask a, a follow-up question to that. Do you, do you think that for anybody that may not have gotten that uh, affirmation, because now I, I hear you saying that they didn't seek it out, but they received affirmation from two. Do you think that was a significant, a significant difference for, for the four? Like, did, did that cause them to sort of question what they experienced as a call? Well, there was only two that went directly from the a minister, a clergy person, specifically saying it. And of those, I would say one um, was a watershed moment. All these people who were called, uh, well, I'll say four of the five that were called, had a call experience before saying, yes, I'll go into ministry. So there was, there was a gap. There's a difference between that acknowledgement that God is asking them to do something with their lives. That doesn't necessarily mean paid accountable clergy. That could mean other things. It, that, um, that impetus, though, of that clergy that made a difference, particularly with the one. I think the other one, um, by description, was already on that journey, had already heard uh, affirmation from other places. It was just that uh, the clergy where they finally said, fine, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. Um, but it was one in particular that I think it made all the difference of them accepting, at least at that time. Who, it's possible they could have uh, found another way to be called you know, after. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Bill. Is there Can any... I ask it with Sam Don? Yes, Simba, please. This is the fourth. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you for the presentation. And greetings to everyone uh, listening. My, my question is, given that we have talked about Sunday school uh, learning for the children and the development upwards. Do you think it is important to have Christian life while in university studies? Very good question. One of one of the uh, questions I asked the each participant was their involvement in uh, faith communities during their uh, college years, during their university time. And it was mixed. Uh, some had very little to do with it. 
uh, virtually none. Others were very involved. The ones that were involved, uh, all but one, I'll, I'll talk about one in a moment, all of them were involved in ecumenical, and in one case, interfaith community groups, so they, uh, faith groups, so they weren't just United Church groups, they were interdenominational. One person, um, uh, I forget the name of the, the denomination that they were close to, um, it's not one of the ones I've already mentioned, but uh, anyway, it was a, they assumed that they would not have a partnership with someone of this denomination. As, as it turned out, they found they had lots more in common than they thought, and they were quite glued at the hip. So it was a big thing. One, uh, there was one who continued to attend and worship at a United Church outside of the, the college, so outside of campus life, and that was sufficient for them. But uh, most uh, of the rest of them, other than one, one had no involvement, but the rest all were involved in some way or another with uh, either interfaith or interdenominational faith communities, uh, including taking leadership roles in those communities. Thank you. You're welcome. So my, my, my three colleagues in this journey together have asked questions, and my professor did. Is there other hands uh, up on the online? I can't see from here, so I'll assume no then. I don't see anybody. Right. Maybe go to the audience and see. That's where I was going next. Did anybody else have a have a question? A few more came in, by the way. I don't know what we're at, 35 or so, I guess. Yes? Did you have, with your participants, were they gender-based, or did you have mixed? Yeah, I was hoping no one would ask that. Um, <laughs> I only wanted to talk to the women. But, uh, <laughs> no, uh, of, of the genders, there was four men and two women. Um, I was hoping to get the, you know, 50-50, I guess you would say. Um, but in the responses and the timing of those that were getting back to me, it, it just worked out. There was, was that. I did have one more female who kind of late said she would like to participate. So even though I had already transcribed and it was all, all down this, I thought it would really be good to have one more, so I said sure, and then again, I never heard back from her, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was four, uh, four male and two female. Predominantly um, uh, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. Again, not by design, it's just how it worked. Obviously, it would have been far more valuable to have uh, a wider demographic gender-wise and just more participants, but in the time that we have to do this study um, start to finish, it just uh, doesn't make itself practical. Any other questions? It was interesting to note the, the number that participated in these programs uh, you know, in their youth and how that affected them. The, the, yeah, for those on the online, I'm not sure if you heard that or not. Did you hear that okay? Not sure. No. Okay, it, uh, essentially it was um, just a comment about, uh, interesting to note how many were involved in the youth programming uh, as youth, how they were all involved in that, and she reflected how um, herself, who's a very active church member today and a contributor and someone I can say, could you read this for me today, uh, <laughs> participates. Um, and, uh, and some of the programming that were brought to them that has remained with them um, through these years. So thank you, Shirley. Yes, Peggy. John, was there a, uh, an influence that the participants showed for, have, had, were they invited to be part of worship leadership in their growing up years? And I don't mean through the Sunday school, but I mean through uh, their adult, if we want to call it that way, the, the worship life of the church? So the question was, were the participants invited to be part of the worship experience, not as um, kids worshiping, but as part of the life of the church in worship? Did I, 
um, mixed, um, diverse. Uh, some, some, um, one person preached their first sermon, not to do with youth, just said, I want to preach a sermon at nine years old. Uh, the same person was reading, uh, read the Bible during grade two. And uh, this person's parents would give them, uh, this person, an incentive, um, a reward if they were to read something other than uh, faith-based material, just to give them a more diverse... Uh, so, um, quite diverse. Now, some, um, some of the participation was solely as part of the youth group. Now, more the senior youth group, not so much the Sunday schools. So they were involved. Many of them also led worship when the minister was away, so they didn't just join in by habit, but they did take over if the minister was away. Uh, it's actually one of the very specific questions I answered or I asked. Um, there wasn't enough commonality to call it a theme, uh, but I was curious if participating in worship did influence them. I suspect it did. All of them talked about it in various ways. Uh, I'd say none went through their years not participating in some way. But as I said, some represented the youth, like it was Youth Sunday and they led the worship service. Um, another one, not the one I've already mentioned, but another one at a relatively young age was writing prayers for, for that Sunday and, uh, you know, and directly involving creation of the worship experience. Um, this is a person who has a heritage of family, a clergy in the family, um, but on their own initiative, it's something that they, they did. So I think, let me restate your question and you let me know if I've got it correct. Are the, are the theological colleges listening to the young people and adapting for the ways they like to learn or would be better suited to learn? Uh, I'm gonna say in some ways uh, that I'm aware of, but I can't really represent those colleges honestly, so I have to be careful there. But uh, they have taken, in, taken advantage of technologies. All of them can do, on, like a lot of my learning is done online. It's not the same as being in the classroom, but it's come a lot closer to making it a, a classroom experience. I've got to know people very well who I've never seen their face. And if they didn't give me their name, and I guess it's only a guess based on their name, I wouldn't know their gender necessarily, but I still get to know them uh, very well. So there's dabbling in it, but I can't answer that honestly. I, I don't really know what they have going. I'm sure some more than others would be. <laughs> it would probably be a fair answer. Thanks for I, I would just jump in there and say that I agree. I, I really think that's quite, quite a fair critique of theological education. We need to be more open to the ways that young people learn and diversity of learning styles and what they bring. And I think that uh, that, is, that is certainly uh, some, a, a takeaway from this. Absolutely. Good. Good point. She's the professor there, so we can. Uh, <laughs> Does the United Church have youth programs that ministers can go to and get used? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, depends how you how I answer that. They do have some youth programming. The uh, a lot of it is you you acquire it, but they recommend it. Uh, other cases, they have specific programs that they've really uh, advertised, like Messy Church, for example. Um, and there's other programs, but as far as I know, there isn't, uh, you know, you go to the website and you can download a youth program specifically, but there's lots of themes and lots of material we have advantage, uh, we get to take advantage of books, programs, other things. It's just a matter of doing it. It's all there. It's easy to do. It's just a matter of doing it. Yeah. I got scowling from my, my um, peers. <laughs> <laughs> Days past, High C was an organized yes. kind yeah. of thing. Yes. CGIT, there was an organizational structure, and you went to CGIT, you went to Explorers, then you got to go to CGIT, and then you got to go to High C. It was sort of like that. But we don't have, I, we don't have that. We don't really have that, but we do have, but thanks for that, Barb. The, um, it just reminded me, within our church structure, 
we do have opportunities throughout the year for youth events to participate in. We do have opportunities for them to directly participate in our annual conferences, uh, in our presbytery meetings, other things like that. So we do give them opportunities kind of in the politics of the, of the, um, of the denomination. Um, but, in other, um, but in other facilities as well. We just had a rendezvous. Did it just happen or it is happening? Last August, um, rendezvous is a...